you, Lord. Thank you so much for bringing us onto this platform. Thank you, Father, that uh, Dr. Matanda is selfless to always just give up her time. Even though she's at work, she's willing to share with us um, her knowledge, her experience, her expertise. Um, and we just ask that you will lead and guide her, dear Father. We want to be healthy. We want to know what to do to prevent illnesses. Um, instead of just treating it. And for those that are ill, how to better uh, uh, the condition with treatment and to understand it better so that even though we have conditions that we can manage it better, dear Father. We just ask for the outpouring of your spirit and we ask to lead and guide. And thank you, Lord, for the amazing bodies that you have given us. Thank you for how you have made us help us to look after what you have given us um, properly. This is my prayer in your loving name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to switch my camera off so that there's one person's camera that's on, and also you can hear me better then. So um, <laughs> someone has a question, uh, uh, what can I eat to avoid fall, falling uh, fall out in love? I'm tired. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay um so if you have your questions you can answer i know a lot of people also want to know how do you get a heart disease so we're gonna uh, uh, we get, i'll use layman's terms how do you get a heart disease when you have diabetes for example how do you get a heart disease when you have um, high blood pressure what is the link between um, uh, we call it in medicine cardiovascular diseases and non-communicable diseases, and those are hypertension and diabetes. But we'll just speak about uh, 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 sugar, as, as also commonly referred to people say that I have sugar, diabetes. Uh, what is the, the relationship between um, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular diseases? Please, Dr. Matanda, if you can just explain to people, why do they go together? Okay, that will take me another month to explain, <laughs> to explain the links. I'll try to shorten it. Let me start with high blood pressure. So when we are saying someone has got high blood pressure, we are saying that the heart has to work a lot harder to get the blood to where it is supposed to be. There is something that we call peripheral resistance. It means that is up, right? And the heart has to work harder to overcome that resistance and make sure enough blood reaches the organs, including the heart itself. It also needs a uh, um, blood supply, right? So you realize that as the heart has to go against such high pressures, it has... Okay, I think there's someone with their uh, mic on. I'm getting feedback but it's fine, let's continue. So as the heart is working harder to overcome those high blood pressures, uh, it thinks that if it grows bigger, it can overcome the pressures. For a moment, that works. The heart muscle gets bigger and it gets stronger, but it will come a point where the heart muscle going bigger is not helping anymore, you know? So the, the bigger it gets up to a certain stage, the bigger it gets, the more useless it becomes. So the heart actually reduces inefficiency. In the first place, it was increasing in size to try and gain efficiency. But after a certain point, it then passes that stage and it continues grow, growing bigger. And that actually reduces its efficiency. Then someone gets into heart failure. Um, then the the diabetes is uh, is an underlying risk factor for heart disease. It is strongly strongly related with heart disease. Diabetes is in, related to a condition that we call insulin resistance. Well, there's lots of biochemistry that goes on, <laughs> but the baseline is your endothelium becomes dysfunctional. Which one is your endothelium? Your blood vessels, the ones that carry blood, especially the other, especially the arteries, they are lying. Vessel is let's say it's this big. Inside the heart vessel, there's a special membrane that lines those heart uh, that those uh, blood vessels, and this special lining is what we call the endothelium. Now, the endothelium has got a lot of regulatory uh, uh, jobs to do. 
it releases what we know as nitric oxide, which is going to help the heart muscle relax. It has got platelets. It's going to prevent uh, clots from happening. It's going to clot when it needs to. So with diabetes, there is continuous endothelial dysfunction. That, uh, because of diabetes, that endothelium doesn't function well. It is, it is disrupted. And as the endothelium is disrupted, it's going to promote plaque formation. Uh, the plaques are the ones that build up inside the, the artery. And in, those, in that plaque, there's fat that gets deposited in there. And you know, the fat just gets attached to the endothelium, but it's not part of the endothelium. So it's really loose, you know? It's not as attached as if it was an original uh, part of the endothelium. It's just coming to stick on top of it. So if... Um, as the, blood, uh, as the blood moves along, there is a chance that that plaque gets dislodged and then it's washed downstream. And the thing with arteries is the ones that are upstream are bigger in diameter than the ones that are downstream. And you realize that arteries, as they go downstream, they become smaller. Also arteries that supply organs like that supply the, the heart, like that supply the kidney, they get smaller in size. And this plaque that has been dislodged is going to, it has been dislodged from a bigger, uh, from a bigger artery. And as it goes down into a smaller artery, it's going to block that artery because it's coming from an artery that is that's as big as this. And then now it has to force itself through arteries that have gone so small. So this is going to block the arteries and then there's no blood supply downstream. When there's no blood supply downstream, it means there's no delivery of oxygen and whatever muscle that was supposed to be supplied by this artery is going to die. So if this happens in the brain, then someone gets um, stroke. And if this happens in the heart, which happens to be our point of discussion today, someone gets a heart attack. And also at that point where the plaque is forming, as it gets dislodged, the endothelium senses that there's been an injury. So when there's an injury, there's platelets that get attracted to that area to try and stop bleeding. Then they, the platelets release chemicals that attract other platelets to come and then they form a mesh and that thrombus can grow. So, this thrombus, which is growing from at this place where the plaque has been displaced, can grow so big that it also blocks the uh, it blocks the artery, and the same process happens. There is no blood flow downstream. There is no oxygen supply, and the muscle that was supposed to be supplied it is going to get to die because nothing can live without oxygen. We can't live without oxygen for for long. So. High blood pressure and diabetes, they put your, also they put your endothelium, more so diabetes, it puts your endothelium, uh, it makes your endothelium to be, the, your endothelium to be dysfunctional. That's why you realize that most people with diabetes are going to have one, uh, you know, in, in varying degrees, they're going to have heart disease. And that's why we emphasize you just break it up, Dr. So Matanda. More controlled and that can put you at risk. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Can am I more audible? Let me try to yes. come closer to my gadget. Okay. Yes. So you realize that the effect, the, the risk is cumulative, which means. If you have diabetes, let's say, for example, if you have diabetes, your risk is 10%. And if you have, if, uh, you have uh, high blood pressure, your risk is 10%. If you have both, that risk is going to be way more than 20%. It's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's more, more or less, it's, it, the risk gets multiplied rather than just simple addition, you know. So mm -hmm. these two diseases, you, you mustn't have both at the same time. If you happen to have both at the same time, you really have to go out of your way to make sure they are all controllable. And also to make sure that you reduce the other risk factors. So you need to get active because inactivity 
is one thing that has been proven over and over again to increase your risk of uh, heart disease. So the inactivity, if you're smoking, you just have to stop. I keep telling people, cutting down on smoking is not good enough. One cigarette is one too many. And with smoking, I keep using this expression. Smoking and pregnancy are the same. It's either you're pregnant or you're not. You're not cut down on pregnancy. You don't become like, oh, I, I, I reduced. It's either you do or you don't. It's either you smoke or you don't. It's either you're pregnant or you're not. So if you are smoking, even half a cigarette a day, you need to stop. Smoking accelerates your endothelial damage and it's going to, um, you, you, that damage is going to happen at an extensive stage. Like for example, you know, I was explaining about endothelial damage. It might be happening in one part, but not happening in the other part. But if you're smoking, you are literally putting all your arteries diffusely at risk of endothelial damage. So you need to make sure you stop smoking. You also need to eat healthy. If you go back to the talks that we had, we go into detail about how a plant-based diet helps you. Um, it helps to control your cholesterol. It's going to help to um, lessen the, the, the risk of insulin resistance. It's going to help to control already existing diabetes or already existing hypertension, even already existing heart, uh, heart problems. If you, your diet is more of plant-based, the more plants you eat, the less or no animal products at all, the better for you. So there is an interlink at a cell level between uh, diabetes and heart disease, also between hypertension and heart disease. And these three together, they make things worse. I'm just trying to put in summary. I hope I'm actually not confusing you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. So... Uh, all muscles must get big, but the heart muscles mustn't get the heart muscle mustn't get big. That's not a good thing. You're saying, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, someone in the in the chat is asking, what could be signs of early heart problems? Let's say when there is shortness of breath, um, when breathing in, feeling tired, some on and off chest pains on the left side, and sometimes numbness or cold feeling on the left arm and fingers. Okay. So what this person is describing makes me worried for heart disease because that, that, that's typical of heart disease. But I want you to understand that diseases share symptoms. So shortness of breath might be your heart might be your lungs, might be because you, you have too little blood. So I would advise once you get those symptoms, please visit your doctor so that your doctor can, you know, there's uh, questions that they'll ask you and they can, you know, they can sort of sieve through and say, uh, is this heart, is this lung? Because their symptoms are similar. But generally speaking, heart symptoms include, and I want you to get it. It doesn't mean when you have these symptoms, this is equal to heart, heart disease. It can mean any other disease, but generally speaking, heart symptoms include shortness of breath. You know, you know they, you, we expect you to get short of breath only when you have done like strenuous exercise. You mustn't get short of breath just by cleaning your house or walking around at a normal pace or uh, dressing up or you know, just doing the normal chores in the house, just normal activity, you're not supposed to feel short of breath. So when you get that, you feel short of breath, you're now feeling short of breath easier. We, get, we need to make sure that your heart is fine. Also chest pain. You see that there's some chest pain that you might have uh, that we call angina. And this chest pain, this, if it is angina, it's, we describe it in two, either it's stable or unstable. Stable angina means that the pain comes when you are only active, when you get to a certain extent of activity, then you get pain. And stable angina is this pain that happens whether you're sitting or, you know, there's no pattern to the pain. It can come anytime. And that's a bit more worrying. And this pain, if it is cardiac pain, it's typically a crushing pain. Like you feel like your, your house is sitting on your chest. It's, it's a crushing pain. You feel like, you know, it, it just a, like, a, like a truck is, is running over you. And sometimes it can go up your jaw. 
Sometimes it goes down your arm. Sometimes it can go to your back. Okay. So, and this pain is, is you know, it's the best way to describe it is, is crushing pain. You feel like you are being crushed. There's a heavy, heavy weight that has been put on your chest and you can't, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, that's the kind of pain. And it's like I said, it radiates up to your jaw. It can go down your arm. It can go to your back. Sometimes it just feels like heartburn. So mm. sometimes when someone comes and say, oh, I have heartburn, I also want to ask you a few questions and say, is this real, real heartburn or is this uh, uh, pain that makes me worried about uh, a heart disease, especially a heart attack? Then let me make this point. For people with diabetes, you might not feel anything. Nothing. Because diabetes messes up with your nerves. So because your nerves are messed up, you, you, know, you don't feel pain. You know That's why we tell people with diabetes not to make sure they don't use hot water. They don't put their feet in hot water. If there's no one to help them check the temperature of the water, we tell them to wear closed shoes, which are comfortable because they can get hurt and they don't even feel it because their sensation has gone in the feet. That's the same way the sensation goes in the feet. Uh, it's the same way the sensation goes even from the heart. So sometimes someone with diabetes might actually not feel any pain and yet a heart attack is going on. So uh, and for people with diabetes, sometimes they, gen they, they then just feel uh, uh, short of breath. They can't go. They can't do uh, the same activity they used to do. So that's with, with, uh, with heart disease, especially with uh, the pain is usually with heart attacks, right? The shortness of breath can be heart attack or can be heart failure. What do we mean when you say heart failure? We are saying the heart is failing to meet the needs of the body. The body needs oxygen. The body needs different types of nutrients. And these nutrients and the oxygen, they're carried by your, by the blood. And the heart is the pump that's supposed to, uh, you know, to pump the blood to go around your, your body. And the, the same system, the same vascular system, you say cardiovascular system, right? That whole same system system is the one that's also supposed to carry the fluid from your legs, from your upper limbs, from your head. It's supposed to carry fluid and blood back to the heart so that it gets pumped again and also to the kidneys so that whatever needs to be cleaned out can be cleaned out. So if your heart is failing, it's, it's not meeting the needs. It's not doing what it is supposed to do. It means you're going to get short of breath, you are going to uh, get uh, your lower, your legs can get swollen sometimes. Sometimes they want or it's just a little bit of swelling. Some you get swell, swollen and the fluid, you know, and you can't, you can't lie flat. You know, you, you, you won't be able to lie flat. You get short of breath. If you lie flat, you find you need to use many pillows. You sort of, now you're using your, your posture to help your heart. Because your heart is not is no longer functioning as it is supposed to be. If you lie flat, it's going to be a problem. You, you, it now needs sort of it needs help. So you are going to uh, put maybe two or three or four pillows. Some people actually sleep almost in a seated position because the heart is now failing to do the circulatory uh, to to do the circulatory function in a in an effective way. Uh, so when you find yourself, you're getting short of breath, your legs are getting swollen, you can't lie flat, you have to wake up in the middle of the night to catch your breath, you feel like you were drowning, you just all of a sudden have to wake up, walk to the window, breathe before you come back and try to sleep again. Those are all symptoms that make us get worried about, uh, about heart disease. Mm -hmm. And if you see this happening at home, please go see your doctor, you need help. And if you're on treatment and these symptoms start worsening, it means the problem is getting worse. It needs to be, it needs to be addressed. So that's, that's what I can say, uh, you know, um, in terms of heart failure. Uh, you can also get fatigue. You know, you're just now so tired. What gives you energy to keep working for your muscles to work is they're getting enough oxygen. So if your heart is failing, the oxygen delivery is coming down, a lot of other organ function is disturbed, you just get tired. So we, you know, this this tiredness, which is out of out of balance, you know. So you just you have fatigue the whole day, you really can't get up and do the, the jobs that you need to that you use used without uh without difficulty. 
So I can say in summary, those are the signs, those are the symptoms rather that we can say when you have them, we are worried about whether you're having a heart attack or whether you're having a uh, heart failure. If you see this happening, you need to go and get seen by, um, by a doctor. But remember, like I said, it's not shortness of breath equals heart disease. It can mm -hmm. be caused by other things, but it, it's also a symptom that can show heart disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. And then uh, you mentioned the stable and unstable angina. So when would people use the, the, the tablets that they put under the tongue so nicely? The, um, the, okay. Uh, I saw right. it all. <laughs> the nitrate is fine. Uh, so yeah, yeah, nitrate, yeah. Those ones are for temporary relief because you're having, you know, when you're having that pain, it's telling you that there is, you know, the oxygen supply to the muscle has, has gone down. So you need to dilate. You're trying to say, okay, my artery is this and is half blocked. Let me try to dilate it and open so that blood can, can flow through. It's a really temporary measure for that we use so that you can sort of dilate your, your, your arteries for that moment and the pain, uh, the pain goes down. It's not something permanent and we are not happy for you to be dependent on those. We don't want you to always like morning, afternoon, you know, you're taking it. So what's actually causing the pain to come on is because there is now little supply of oxygen to the heart muscle. And that happens when the vessel is occluded when the diameter has gone down. Some, if, if it completely shut down, like 100% off, then you get a, a, a myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction, what we call a heart attack. When you're still at the stage of angina, it's not completely closed, but it's, it's getting there. And so when you give you those tablets that you put under your tongue, they're going to sort of help to, to open up, mm. try to dilate, so that some blood can pass through and then oxygen can get to the heart muscle that is dying. And then once oxygen starts getting to the heart muscle, the pain goes down because now the oxygen is getting there. Now the muscle is leaking again and then uh, the pain comes down. So those tablets are just for temporary relief and we do not want you to be so dependent on them so that you're using them you know, very, uh, very frequently. It's actually a bad sign that you have to take them you know, frequently. And when we give you, we tell you, when you get the, when the pain is coming on, you take this. And when you come for review, we ask you, how often have you had to use this? Because that gives us an idea of um, of what's going on. So whether you have step angina or step angina, you can use, uh, you can use them for temporary relief. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Matanda, someone here just wants to know um, as well, um, is it true that when you wake up at night, needing to go to the toilet, you need to sit for three minutes before you actually uh, can get up to walk to avoid a heart attack. Okay, so that's not entirely medical. <laughs> but what we what we what this person is is trying to you know what people talk about is what we call postural hypotension, right? Mm -hmm. When you ask when you're lying down, you have a blood pressure, right? If I measure the blood pressure when you're lying down, I can measure it and record it. When you get up, some people drop their blood pressure so low from lying down to standing up so that they get dizzy and some can actually collapse. And once they've collapsed and they've lied flat again and a blood supply has been restored, then they wake up. So that's what we call postural hypotension, like your blood pressure goes so, so, so low when you rise from lying down to up. So these people, we try to advise them. When you wake up, you wake up, you sit. Then from sitting to standing, you're trying to help your body to adjust to the different positions. Because if you just go from lying down to standing up straight, your blood pressure drops very low. You get what we call a syncopal episode. You fall down, mm -hmm. but then your circulation is, is restored like in less than 10 seconds and you're up again. So if someone has postural hypotension, then we advise them not to wake up from lying straight to standing and walking because they can fall. We just advise them, you wake up, you sit, you, you then walk. But this is not like everyone. 
uh, you, you must have the condition that we call postural hypotension. And your doctor can diagnose it by measuring your blood pressure while seated and then they make you stand, you stand up and then you, you know, they measure, there's a technique of doing it. They measure the blood pressure again and then they compare, they see if there's been any drop and then they, uh, you know, they calculate the numbers, the speakers that we use. If you're worried that you might have postural hypotension, you can just visit your doctor. They do the measurements for you and they tell you whether you have it or not to worry, you find it's only those people with postural hypotension which can get uh, those uh, um, syncopal episodes once okay. they rise straight from lying down. Thank you, Dr. Matanda. This is a, a nice one. Someone here says, does feeling fatigue and heart pounding irregularities is that the symptom of heart disease? I think, you know, when people have atrial fibrillation, that feeling they get that their hearts are in their throat. Please, can you address okay. that as, also, as well as the treatment for that? And then also okay. the warfarin, the ecotrin, the disparin, because someone did ask me for these things. Why is it important to use these blood thinners, if you can just okay. uh, call it that? When, when someone feels their heart just going out of nowhere, or their heart beating faster, or they are more aware of their heart beat than usual. Because most of us, we go through the day, we never stop to say, oh, my heart is beating, right? <laughs> the heart just beats all the time. We never really take a second to think about it. So there's two things. Yes, it shows that there's something happening to the heart, but it might not be primarily the heart problem. There is an organ called the thyroid, which is in your neck. You don't usually feel it. It's so tiny you only feel it if it has grown big so when this thyroid grows big or when it uh, starts producing a lot of the hormone that is supposed to the, the thyroid hormone you might get these palpitations or you might feel your heart beating irregularly and addressing that means addressing the thyroid so if the thyroid needs addressing we just address it and the heart will be fine so the heart will be like a secondary organ. It's not the primary organ with the problem. It can actually be your what? It can actually be your thyroid. We also want to know what medication you're taking. Uh, is the medication not messing up with your heart conduction system? Uh, what's, what's going on? Then also with the thyroid and sometimes primarily the heart, you can get the extra fibrillation that Connie is asking about. This is when your heart beats irregularly. So your heart is supposed to be regular. Whatever pace is going at, it's supposed to just go, you know, regularly. It's not supposed to go, you know, everywhere, you know. It's supposed to be regular. Whatever pace is going at, it's supposed to be regular. So when you get this condition called atrial fibrillation, which has lots of causes, including the thyroid, including the heart getting bigger, once your heart has gotten bigger, uh, you, you, you are at risk of getting the atrial fibrillation or to those people who smoke, uh, you also get um, you, at risk uh, of getting atrial fibrillation and different types of drugs. There, like a lot, you know, a lot of drugs that can uh, that can cause that. So the first step is to say, it, uh, you feel you are having palpitations, but do you actually have an irregular beat, or these are what we call ectopic beats, beats that's just like, well, your heart has been going smoothly and regularly, then all of a sudden a beat comes and goes boom. Or goes boom, boom boom and then back to back to normal. So the one primary thing that the doctor needs to do to someone who feels that their heart is, is beating out of order is to do what we call an ECG. So on the ECG, a resting ECG to begin with, you trace the heart, you see the conduction, you see if there's any abnormalities, you follow it through and you diagnose whether there's anything. But if you don't find anything on that uh, basic rest, resting ECG, we can go on to do a 24 hour ECG, which is called a water ECG, right? So you get the electrodes attached to you, you go, you spend 24 hours with them and meanwhile they'll be recording and sending it to, uh, to the computer. And at the end of the day, the cardiologist sits with your water and follows every second to try and see where was the problem. And there's some which are advanced that actually make you you know, they get triggered when the irregular beats come. So when the heart beats very fast, it gets triggered. Or you can note down the time and say, at 20 past six, I felt the heart beating very fast. At half past eight, I felt the heart beating very fast. So when your cardiologist is interpreting the water, they can also try to put more attention 
to the times that you that you mentioned and try and see if there is uh if there's anything wrong there's besides the the ecg and the water i would have taken blood as well remember i said the thyroid really affects how the heart beats so we need to make sure that that thyroid is what is okay it's all it's not it's not a thyroid problem so when you get palpitations when you get your heart beating outside the ordinary i would advise that you go get it checked before anything goes wrong it's better for us to say ah well this is we can't find a cause this is something that we call idiopathic or it's no it's not harmful at least when you have been checked then for you to just say ah it will go away by its own and then before you know it you are in a, in a, in a bigger trouble so once you get palpitations and then you get fatigue then you feel like you have dizziness you feel like you want to collapse do go and get seen they will do an ecg they'll check your blood and then they'll interpret it for you Okay, and then Dr. Matanda, why is it important to use um, uh, all these anticoagulants, uh, with oh, Abivofren yeah, yeah. or Zeralto or Dispirin or Ecotran? And also, what is the difference? When will you be put on Dispirin? When will you be put on Warfarin? You know, just so people know. And why is it so dangerous to just take Dispirin for just for fun? You know, people just take okay. it like, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let me come back. You remember when I was explaining how your endothelium becomes dysfunctional? When your endothelium becomes dysfunctional, it favors coagulation. It favors formation of a thrombus. Remember that fat plaque that's on your on your that fat plaque that's on your uh, on your endothelium. It's going to when it dislodges, the endothelium reads that as injury, and once it reads it as injury, it's going to bring more platelets and the platelets are going to release chemicals that are going to attract um, uh, clotting factors to that area and you're going to form a big clot. And that clot can block your vessels and then you get a heart attack. Or if it happens in your brain, you're going to get a stroke. So because when your endothelium is not functioning, you are, you, we call you your procoagulant. We say you are, you are more prone to form a clot when you don't need it. So your, your blood, you know, if I may use layman's terms, your blood is, is thick, right? It's, it's, it's thick, we need to thin it. That's why we call it blood thinners, right? Your blood, you, are, you have a tendency of wanting to clot when a clot is not needed. You only need a clot when you've been injured because then you have to stop the bleeding. But because you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure, you have, uh, you are sm you have been smoking or uh, you have uh, too much cholesterol in your system, your endothelium is damaged for one reason or the other and uh, 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 you, you, you have a tendency of forming a clot. You are going to form a clot even when you don't need it, and then you're going to get a heart attack or you get a stroke, which is going to be a big problem for you. So what we do is we give you a drug that's going to prevent the clotting. And this, the, the aspirin that we give you, it acts on the platelets, like that primary clotting system. That's what it acts on, right? So. There is no difference between dyspirin, ecotrin, you know, it's, you know, Bayer's aspirin is just a matter of what your doctor prefers, but the active ingredient is the same. It's, it's not, there's no big difference. And then why should a normal person not take dyspirin, especially over you know, prolonged periods of time? You know, when you have a, maybe a headache or when you have period pains for women, you might take dyspirin for relief of pain, and they tell you not to take it for more than 10 days. This aspirin, which is the active ingredient, it prevents clotting. So in a normal person where everything is normal, if you prevent clotting and then you get injured, you are not going to be able to clot. You are going to bleed out. In this person who has heart disease, who has diabetes, who has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, who, has, uh, who smokes or who has been smoking or who has uh, other risk factors of clotting, we know that their system is prone to clotting. Their blood wants to clot. So we are preventing it from happening. And because it's hypercoagulable, it's not going to make them bleed out, you see? But if your bleeding system is normal, then we prevent clotting. 
when the need for clotting comes, you are not going to be able to, and then you bleed out. So if you have someone who's normal, who has a normal functioning cardiovascular system, do not take disprint overboard. Just take according to as prescribed or only as, as needed. And if your doctor has assessed you and said you are at risk of clotting, I'm going to give you this, whether it's in Ecotrin, Bayer's Astrid, it's just different names on the market, but the active ingredient is the same. Warfarin is like the big boss <laughs> of anticoagulation. So when, when you, co you coagulate or when you form a clot, there's two ways of doing it. There's what we call the primary clot, which just happens because you have been injured and your platelets come together. They form that sort of temporary primary clot. That's the primary, primary clotting. Then we have secondary clotting. This is what then comes in with reinforcement. And this one, which comes in with reinforcement, it has got different pathways that work together so that you form a, a, a stable clot and you put mesh and you reinforce your clot so that your clot doesn't get dislodged and ble uh, bleeding is stopped you know, completely. So for those people who have certain conditions, especially who have the atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation means your heart is not beating coordinated. Remember I said it's going irregular. And so because it's not coordinated, it's going irregular. It's just like it's flicking and the blood inside is not exactly being squeezed out. So we all know if you put blood, put blood in a, if someone bleeds out, you see that a clot quickly forms. If you put blood even in an open space, like in a, in a someone bleeds out in a, in a cup or anything, that there's going to be a thick clot that forms. Even those who slaughter animals, like you slaughter a chicken or you slaughter a cow or a goat, you realize the blood that, that comes out within minutes, it was already made this big clot. So that's the high risk when you have atrial fibrillation. Your heart is not going through pumping nicely, it's going like this, you know, it's like flickering, there's no coordinated action. Blood which is stagnant is going to clot. And the dangerous thing is this is happening right in the heart. And there's risk that the clots that have formed in the heart are going to be pumped out. So instead of your heart pumping, blood is going to pump out clots. And these clots are going to distribute to go whether to your brain, to, uh, uh, to the kidneys, to all, you know, to the lungs, you know. So this is a bigger problem. We cannot depend on, wafer, on, on aspirin, which works only on this primary system that makes a temporary clot. We need to give you something better to avoid clot formation. And that's when we need to step up and give you warfarin or give you Zarelto, right? Or all the other... Um, uh, fancy drug names that are out there. Mm -hmm. So the warfarin is going to really make sure your blood doesn't clot, which means it has to keep your blood as thin as possible. But there's a measurement that we use, which we call the INR. And the INR, it has a, it has a range that it is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be uh, below, it's not supposed to be above. When it goes above, it means your blood is now too thin. You can bleed out even if you're not injured. You can just bleed into your brain, or then you get a huge uh, 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 brain bleed, or you can bleed out anywhere. You can bleed out into your adrenal glands. You can bleed out into your kidneys. You can, you can bleed out anywhere. So we want to keep that range as tight as possible. So if you're offering, make sure you go for your checks. Make sure your iron arms are done as regular as possible. Uh, this, this the, the two drugs or the two groups of drugs, the aspirins and the warfarins and zaraltos, on the other hand, they both prevent clotting, but the warfarin, the zaralto, they do it at a more efficient, higher stage. The aspirin is more, uh, you know, on the lower, you know, lower end. That's a bit more, more smooth, you know. So mm -hmm. we assess your risk and then we say, is this one okay only with work with aspirin or do we need to give this one uh, uh, warfarin? Okay, okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Matanda. I hope that is understood. Uh, you explained so well. Someone also wants to know, is constant belching or burping or breaking winds um, a sign of heart problem? Because sometimes you have these pains and the minute you kind of burp, then you feel okay. Okay, that's could, not could constant. 
exactly a, pro a problem with the heart, a symptom for the heart. I would think maybe this patient has got a, a, a digestive issue. Yes. It could be inflammatory bowel syndrome, most likely. Uh, when you have a pain, you, the pain gets relieved when you pass gas or when you go to the toilet and your pain gets relieved. It's more inflammatory bowel syndrome than heart attack. It's, it has nothing to do with the heart. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, Dr. Matanda, someone also wants to know, what is a normal heart rate for fit or unfit adults? And what is a dangerously low heart rate? And with that, I'm going to ask you to just say, when do you use a pacemaker? Uh, okay. Let's say, for example, someone has a 30 degree heart block or whatever. When is a pacemaker justified? Okay. So we usually give a range. We say your heart rate for athletes, the heart rate is a bit lower around the 60s, but some athletes, they can even go up to 50s. You see the heart beats at like 55 beats per minute when they are resting. And we say the maximum is a is 100. Anything above 100, we say your heart is going too fast. But the closer you are to 100 at a resting, uh, when you are resting, we're like, um, okay, you are still okay within the range. We're really not going to treat you for having a heart rate of 95 at rest, but you're sort of going towards, you know, the, 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 the boundaries that we don't want you to reach. So on average, someone can be anywhere between 60, 75 bits per minute and you are, you are okay. Uh, how which heart rate is dangerously low. We see, like I was saying, we also assess your lifestyle. Are you an active athlete or you're not? If you're not an athlete, active athlete and you come to me with a heart rate of 50, I sort of, uh, uh, something is not, is not exactly right. And when your heart rate really goes beyond, below 50, we get worried. And when your heart rate goes below 40, we want to try and see, must we put a pacemaker for you? Are you okay? So again, we go back to the ECG. Okay, after you know talking to you, getting your symptoms, examining you, we do the ECG and any form of heart block is going to be picked on the ECG. And the heart blocks, now when we are talking about heart block, we are talking of the heart's electricity. Remember when you're talking about just what we're talking about now, the blood circulation and all, this is like the pumping system. Like look at the house. The house has got electricity and it has the plumbing system, if I may say, that brings water into the house and then that drains the water outside the house. It's the same house. It has two different systems. It has the plumbing system and it has the electricity system. And when electricity is not moving well, if, there's, if you get in your house and you switch on electricity, uh, you switch on the bulb and it doesn't come out, you know, you're like, is there electricity? Is my meter finished? I mean, is the electricity that I loaded finished? Is my meter reading zero? Or it's because of ESCOM, right? And we know most of the time it's ESCOM, right? <laughs> so this is the same thing as your heart. It has got a, a plumbing system, if I may put it that way, which deals with movement of liquid. It also has an electrical system, which moves electrical impulses that are going to then tell the heart muscle to contract. So when you're talking of heart blocks, we are talking about the electricity system. When something blocks the movement of the electricity, there's going to be a problem. And when we do the mighty ECG, we can see and we grade, we say you have primary, you have um, first degree heart block, you have block, you have second degree heart block, and the second degree has got a type one and type, type two, you have a third degree heart block. And with a third degree heart block, you see that your heart rate is usually below 40. Some people go to heart rates of like 20. And you know, they get dizzy, they collapse, they, they are symptomatic. And these are people who need a pacemaker put in because your electricity is not working. We need to correct the connection. Let's give you a, a pump that's that, you know, in a, your like electricity connection that works. We are saying your switch is not clicking because the, the pacemaker is like clicks everything and it, it, it rates everything to go uh, regularly and on time. So if it is not working, why not change the switch? Let's change the switch so that the moment it clicks on, electricity goes. So you now need uh, a, a, a pacemaker, but this is done only after like you do the ECG, you are seen by your cardiologist, they assess you, then they decide on what type of, uh, of pacemaker to put. 
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. Um, there's a question. Um, what food should be taken more? Which one should be avoided to help control diabetes and high blood pressure naturally? I'm going to refer them also to the talk, um, Northern Conference Health Ministry's YouTube channel. Dr. Matanda addresses that when she does the talk on diabetes and on hypertension. But if you can just briefly summarize um, for the person, please, Dr. Matanda. Okay, so I would really encourage people to go see, watch those talks because I go into detail food groups. I, you know, we go into detail about talking about food, but the general advice that I can give you is eat more plants, more of plants, less of animal products. The more plants you eat, the better for you. So that's like general, the general guide. And these plants that you're eating, make sure they're not refined. Okay. Try to eat as unrefined as possible. Instead of, I know rice is, rice is a plant, instead of eating the white rice, you go for the brown rice. Uh, you go for the buckwheat, you go for the quinoa, you go for the different grains that have uh, uh, fiber in them. Instead of going for the, for the, what's the soy sausages, you go for the proper, the, the actual soy, or you go for the actual bean instead of, you know, eating the processed vegan bean sausage <laughs> if i may put it that way maybe mm -hmm. for special occasions for you know special meals you can do it but i really encourage people to eat plants as as close to their nature as possible more plants more fruits more veggies like your mother used to say eat your veggies more veggies more more plants for you your grains make sure they are not refined drink water instead of any other mm -hmm. juices you know the more water you drink there, like pure water, not water that has been, you know, played around with, the, the better for you. I also talk about exercise, how to incorporate exercise, then other lifestyle changes in those uh, in those talks. Uh, there's a talk on diabetes, there's a talk on high blood pressure, and there's, there's a talk on obesity. So you can go visit the page that Connie has said, Northern Conference Health Ministries page on YouTube. And just uh, uh, if you click Northern Conference Health Ministries, there's lots of talks that come up and you can see the diabetes one, you see the hypertension one, you see the obesity one. There's other talks that were done, not by me, but by other colleagues, also even for mental health and stuff like that, which you can, you know, which you can benefit from. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, the more plants you eat as unrefined as possible, the better for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matanda. Um, we have to all remind ourselves that uh, all the time, you know, because now it's Valentine's Day. Everyone is going out and are they eating plant foods? No, they're having <laughs> foods tonight that's going to make them sick. Their hearts aren't going to work nicely. Uh, Dr. Matanda, someone here wants to know, is it possible that one can have hypertensive heart disease angina, heart failure, heart attack, all in one person? And then also, what is left ventricular hypertrophy? Okay. Yeah. Let me start with the left ventricular hypertrophy. Remember what I explained when, I, when we started. When you have high blood pressure, it means your, you know, when the heart is pumping, it has to overcome that pressure for blood to flow. So the side that pumps blood to the whole body is the left side. The right side only pumps blood from the heart to the lungs. So the distance is so short. So the right heart can, you know, just relax. It doesn't have a lot of jobs to do. A lot of, you know, its workload is not as big. But the left heart, it needs to pump the blood out through the heart, down the arteries, down to pump blood with enough force so that it reaches your, your small toe, right, in your, in your feet, right? So when you have high blood pressure, your left heart is going to work harder because it has to overcome that pressure. So your left side becomes big. Remember I said the heart feels, oh, I'm too small for this job. Let me grow big. When I grow big, I can do it. Uh, I can do it better. So you get what we call left, uh, left side, left ventricular hypertrophy. Your muscles grow big, right? Uh, remember, if someone is going to the gym, their biceps, they grow big, right? That's the same thing that happens 
with the left side. Your, your left side of the heart is working so hard to overcome this pressure that the heart muscles are going to grow so big. And then you have what you call left ventricular uh, hypertrophy, which has different uh, divisions as well. And then it's trying to overcome that pressure. And like I said, for a moment, it works. The heart grows big, the muscle grows big, and it can do the job. But it will come a time where it loses that efficiency, and then you get into heart failure. A person can get hypertensive heart disease and still get a heart attack. You know, that's, you can't say, oh, I already have heart hypertrophy. I can't get a heart attack. You can get both. And your heart can still fail. And when you have left ventricular hypertrophy and you have a heart attack, you weaken your heart muscles further, you get into heart failure. So all those disease processes can happen in one person. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Matanda. And then someone here asked, does heart problems cause swelling of legs? Yes, that's what I was explaining uh, when I was talking about the symptoms, that your mm -hmm. legs can swell, your circulatory system is not working, the pump that was supposed to work to push the fluid is not, is not working. So fluid gets stagnant in the parts that are furthest from the pump, including your, your legs. So fluid can settle there and then your legs get swollen. It's a sign, uh, it's, a, it's a possible symptom of um, heart disease. Okay. Uh, and then Dr. Matana, we're just gonna go, we know you are on duty. We just do another five minutes till half past. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. And then someone wants to know, is it okay to take supplements when one is taking beta blockers? I, I suppose this is vitamin supplements and stuff. Okay. So we actually give patients who have heart failure some supplements. We give them thiamine because we know thiamine actually helps with heart function, right? So if taking the vitamin supplements and you're on treatment for your, for your heart problem, you know, it doesn't have a problem. If you want to be sure, just show your, your doctor which supplements you're taking because some of these over-the-counter supplements, they have a lot of combination vitamins. You can never really know what exactly is in there. So you can always show your doctor what supplements you're taking and they can read through and say, oh, okay, this is fine. But most of the time, vitamin supplements are not a problem when you, have, uh, when you are on any form of heart uh, treatment. Okay. Thank you. And then... Charles wants to know, good evening. I'd like to know, um, I'm a low blood pressure person. Each time I'm stressed or thinking a lot or relaxed, my whole body becomes cramped for some time. I get dizzy and weak. And if I drink very cold water, it starts to fade away. Is it a sign of a heart problem? Okay. So your problem is hypotension. There are you know, people who have hypotension who generally just have low blood pressure and some, you have to go through extensive investigations. So what happens when you drink the very cold water, it's going to cause your vessels to constrict. They're going to, you know, when they constrict, they improve the blood circulation and then you, you, begin, to, uh, you begin to feel better. And that can make you feel better when you, when you suddenly dropped your, 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 your blood pressure. So low blood pressure is a bit difficult to manage. You really don't have a heart problem. It's just the hypotension which needs management, but not a, a heart problem per se. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Matanda. I'm just going to ask, for when would someone need a stent, right? And then how long? would a stent last? Because very often people think, oh, I've got a stent, I'm fine now. Um, you know, I can again eat and do whatever I want to. Um, how should one go forward uh, having had a stent? Okay, so when you remember I was saying a heart attack comes when your blood vessels have blocked. So a stent, what they do with the stenting is they are putting in a, 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 a synthetic fiber now or they're putting in a mesh, which is going to expand inside the, the blocked uh, heart vessel and open it. So it's in a way, it's sort of, you have been given a second chance, but the same factors that cause the clot to grow in the same place, to develop in the same place, in the first place, uh, can still cause blockage of the stent. So when you have a stent, it's not a license to 
smoke, eat anyhow, drink anyhow, not have activity, you know. The same risk factors that make the thrombus or the clot to develop in the first place can still cause blockage of the stent. So you still need to take care of your stent as you would your normal heart arteries. Um, and it, how long it will last depends on your lifestyle, depends on how quick another clot or another plaque is gonna is going to form. So you still need to adhere to the lifestyle um, uh, lifestyle adjustments so that you 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 protect your stent. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. And then someone also asked, what causes cramps when you are on medication? Okay, so it depends on where the cramps are, what medication you're taking. Some medication like the statins, the, the ones that lower your cholesterol, they are known to have a side effect of causing cramps. So sometimes it's the side effect of the drugs you're taking, but then you weigh risk versus benefit. The cramps versus a heart attack, you're like, what can I choose? <laughs> you know, you're already in a tight spot. Uh, it's not easy to manage side effects for, for, of, of drugs. So some drugs like statins, the atovastatin, the simvastatin, or zoco, as it is known, uh, or uh, atovastatin or lipito, as you know, different drug names, they can cause you to have cramps. But it all depends on where the cramps are. Maybe the cramps are not even related to the medication. Uh, it's another disease process that's going on that needs uh, that needs to be assessed. But we come down to assessing risk versus benefit. Okay. Dr. Matanda Samanya also wants to know um, what causes low blood pressure? Okay. So like I said, low, hypotension or low blood pressure is a, it's really a difficult diagnosis to, you know, to work around. Sometimes you never know exactly what is wrong. You never know. And then you just sort of, how can we manage this? Uh, drink more fluids, add a little bit of salt to your diet, uh, you know? So you, 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 you sometimes you really don't know why and it's all from patient to patient and it's not one of the easiest things to deal with I must admit okay okay thank you so much I hope that person is uh has been answered that listened then someone wants to know what's the problem when the systolic is 150 millimeters mercury and the diastolic is 55. So uh, they want to know what is it if your blood pressure is 150 over 55? Okay. okay. So this person has got what we call isolated systolic hypertension, which is the most common type of high blood pressure. So high blood pressure, it can cause the upper number to go up, the lower number also to go up. But oftentimes it causes the upper number to go up while the lower number remains normal, you still have hypertension. We just call it systolic hypertension and you're still supposed to be on medication. You're still supposed to be, uh, you're still supposed to do all the lifestyle changes and eat right. And you realize that even when you're on medication, it's not going to lower your the, the diastolic number or the lower number that much. Me, the medication you're going to be given, there's different class of drugs. So your doctor is going to choose a drug class that's going to reduce the top number more than the lower number. That's called, you just have isolated systolic hypertension. Provided this blood pressure has been measured correctly, and it has been repeated, and it has been repeatedly shown that it is raised, especially blood pressure that's checked at home. It's more reliable than blood pressure that gets checked at the doctor. I mean, when you're at the doctor, it's a, it's a different environment. You are scared. They're in the queues. Someone is coughing. You're thinking maybe they've given you COVID. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot going on. You're seeing this doctor who is looking so sophisticated, and, you know, he, there's lots of disturbances that happen, and it can cause the step, you know, it can cause your blood pressure to be high when your blood pressure is actually not high, which, which is what we call white coat hypertension. But we have realized that blood pressures that get done at home, this is home, this is your house, this is you, you are relaxed, you are in your usual environment, you take your blood pressure and you check to see the numbers. This is what we encourage, home-based measurements of our blood pressures. And then we link them to the office best, and then we try and see are you actually hypertensive or not? So this reading must be reproducible. You can't have 
one reading which is high and the other readings are normal. And then we say, oh, you have, you have high blood pressure based on that one reading that you had. So we want to have a persistently high reading that is reproducible as high, that is measured in the most in a comfortable environment, preferably uh, home measurements. So uh, uh, systolic hypertension is something that happens very commonly. And we actually do give you treatment that um, targets the systolic blood pressures for you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Richard is asking a question, but I can't open the thing that he, so if you can type your blood pressure, please. The next person says, my feet are sensitive to heat and are always swelling and painful. What could be causing it? I wear ankle socks every day. I also exercise a lot. Okay, this person is saying their feet are sensitive to heat. heat and it's always swelling and painful. Okay, I would want to know if the palms are also swelling and painful, uh, they're also sensitive to heat. Uh, uh, is it just feet, isolated feet? I would advise maybe they get their thyroid checked as well because the thyroid plays a big role in temperature regulation. So they must just get their thyroid checked to make sure uh, everything is fine. Otherwise, it's just a local, uh, uh, a local reaction that happens, but they're not supposed to be painful. They might just swell up because it's hot, but it's usually not supposed to cause pain. So can they also get, it's good that they're exercising. Can they continue exercising? That will, that will help them. They mustn't wear tight ankle socks. If the ankle socks we just need to check that they're not, they're not tight and don't wear them if it's hot already. Uh, just uh, take them off, mm. uh, but then just pass by your doctor and get your thyroid checked and let's see how that goes. Because she's uh, the person says, yes, hands do sweat uh, as okay. well. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the, the person that was asking about the blood pressure, which is Richard M, um, you're on the screen. It's 185 over 66. So they want to know if that okay. is. No. No, that's, the, that's not the, the pulse is 94, BP 185 over 66. No, that's not normal. That's high blood pressure ranges, right? Like it's high, especially the 185 one. It's too high. So what I would advise this person, if they're not already on medication, they need to take another measurement and go to see their doctor. If they are already on medication, they must take their medication as prescribed and they must start recording the blood pressures and then the doctor can adjust the medication. But as it stands, that reading is not normal. Not to panic, but it's not normal. We just need mm -hmm. to get it attended to. Okay, because that heart is pumping uh, very hard, yeah, like you said. It's fine. I'm not too much worried about the pulse. I'm worried about that 185. Yeah, but as I'm saying, it's pumping against the, the pressure that's so high. Exactly. The heart is pumping against that pressure. That's too much. And then also, I know we're talking about the heart, but just so that people understand, Dr. Matanda, why is it important to treat these blood pressures when it comes to kidneys uh, uh, specifically? Because a lot of people just leave it. They treat naturally. They do whatever, but they don't. And, and they stop and start, start treatment all the time. Like people will say, no, no, I, I, I take my tablets and then sometimes they leave it again for a month to see if they can do without it and then they start feeling sick and then they take the tablets again right right so remember i said the arteries as they get to organs they get smaller and the smaller arteries are the ones that are, get affected so your your kidney vasculature is going to be affected because remember your kidneys are this small right and the arteries are also going to be even smaller and your kidney is very crucial in regulating your blood pressure. So in as much as it is, it is very crucial in regulating your blood pressure, it also dies from high blood pressure. So when your blood pressures are not controlled, your kidneys are going to die. And because your kidneys are dead, you have killed the um, regulatory station of your blood pressure. So in turn, your blood pressure is going to even be higher. So this now becomes a vicious cycle. High blood pressure kills your kidney. When your kidney is dead, your, high, your blood pressure goes even higher. So you need to be very careful when you're diagnosed with high blood pressure, please stick to the treatment and stick to monitoring. Get a doctor who can work with you. You wanna try diet, you wanna try lifestyle, you wanna try this and that, get a doctor who is willing to work with you and you get monitored so that you can understand and see 
how the doctor is adjusting your medication. You, it's not, you know, you can't just say, um, because I'm not eating right, so my blood pressure is fine, you know? You, we need to see, okay, you're eating right, that's fine, but you still need some help. Oh, how are you eating right and your blood pressure is not fine, so you're okay. That monitoring is needed. Okay, because someone here says there's a blood pressure which is dangerous, which does BP, which dangerously spikes up once in a couple of months need treatment. Okay, so it depends on what are they going dangerous. Some people get worried only when their blood pressure has gone, uh, the, like the uh, uh, top reading has gone beyond 200. But even a reading of 140, the 140, it still causes problems. So do mm -hmm. not wait for it to go dangerously high, you know? You, we, you need it monitored. It has to be consistent. We need to make sure that all these other times it's actually fine. By fine, I mean it's less than 120 over less than 80. We need to watch it when it's up to the systolic, which is the top reading is up to 139, and the diastolic is up to 85. We need to keep a close eye on you. Once the systolic goes 140 and above, we need to start discussing treatment. We need to discuss serious lifestyle adjustments. We need to see if we have to put you on treatment, maybe start with the lowest blood pressure medication or try low salt, eat more plants, exercise, drink water, take out all these fizzy, fancy drinks. You know, once your systolic reaches 140, there is need for active management, whether it is still your lifestyle adjustment or now you actually have to go to actual uh, blood pressure treatment. This is done in consultation with your doctor with careful monitoring. The problem with blood pressure is it's silent. It doesn't tell you when it's dangerously high. That moment when you see that it's dangerously high could be by coincidence on that day that you checked. But maybe two days back, three days back, it was still dangerously high, but it was not giving you any alarm, uh, uh, alarm signs. So because high blood pressure is a silent killer, we do not want to say, ah, it gets high only once in two months. How do we know the readings or were you checking on a daily basis all these other days? Because sometimes it can still go dangerously high and you don't feel it. It, mm. it needs careful, uh, careful monitoring. Thanks, Dr. Matanda. Last question. When do people get epistaxis or nosebleeds from severe hypertension uh, and the dangers of that? Please. Okay, so this is when, we, when you have very high blood pressure, we classify you into hypertensive, severe hypertension or hypertensive agency or hypertensive emergency. So you have reached that point where maybe your systolic blood pressure or the top reading is reading like 230, the lower reading is reading like 140. That's dangerously, dangerously high blood pressure. And you can get epistaxis and you can get bleeding into your brain. And you we can say you have had a, 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 it is a cerebral hemorrhage from the blood pressure. That's a big complication. And things don't have to get there. Let's get our numbers checked. Let's keep our numbers controlled and we avoid such situations. Thank you so much, Dr. Matanda. I wanted to mention that because, uh, you know, not only does blood pressure impact the heart, it impacts the kidneys, it impacts so many other organs. So we have to take responsibility for our health. And we would like to thank uh, Dr. Matanda for, for um, answering all our questions you gave everyone a free consultation for which we are very grateful because if you go to a doctor you're going to pay guys so thank you for doing all of this for free and thank you for your time whilst you're on duty the lord was good no one called you so yeah <laughs> we're very grateful that you were able to uh present to us and so whilst it is valentine's day we just thought it appropriate to speak on heart health because cardiovascular diseases is the number one killer globally. Um, uh, and, and it's no different for us in, in South Africa, uh, uh, apart from the other pandemics and epidemics that we are faced with, um, you know, cardiovascular disease still remains the number one killer um, globally. And so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining.